Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is a new series for the second three months, that is April, May, and June of 2015. And this particular series of lessons is on the book of Luke. And so, of course, we're going to start out talking about the coming of Jesus. This is lesson number one in that series for April 4 of 2015. We'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we begin this lesson. Our kind and wonderful Father, how can we ever thank you enough for sending your Son, who came and lived that absolutely incredible life that showed how wrong Satan was and how right you were about all your claims and all your statements, and the one who died for us, showing us the dangers of sin and why we should avoid it at all costs. We thank you now for this series of lessons that will teach us more about that experience. May we learn it well as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> A word or two about Luke and about these two books, as most of our listeners probably are well aware, the two books, Luke and Acts, are a two-part uh, series in the New Testament, um, written to a certain Theophilus. What do we know about Theophilus? <clears throat> says an unknown Christian. We don't know who he was. Uh, probably was a real person. Some people have suggested Theophilus means a lover of God, and some people have suggested that just this is, a, this is a letter addressed to whoever loves God, every Christian maybe. Uh, but it's a, a two-part history. The books Luke and Acts are a two-part history of the origin and the history of the, of the Christian church. It was the, clearly, the book of, include the book of Acts, which we won't be studying, but we'll be referring to sometimes. The book of Acts is the story of the new church, and of course the book of Luke is, is his version of this, the life of Christ. <clears throat> um, it's possible, some have suggested, that Theophilus may have been a person who was very interested in Christianity and actually was willing to pay for the expenses of producing this book. We don't know that for sure, but that's a possibility. Um, it took a while for the people in the early Christian church to accept the writings of Luke. Do you know why? He wasn't well, Greek. Yeah. wasn't a Jew. He wasn't a Jew. That was number one. He, he wasn't was, a disciple. Yeah. He was not a disciple. Yeah. But that's not the only reasons. He didn't have direct contact with Jesus. Mm -hmm. He didn't have direct contact with Jesus. Anything else? He spoke favorably of women. Oh, dear. And children. Oh, dear. <laughs> and non-Jews. Yeah, even a marriage. Yeah, boy. Um, one of my favorite verses I like to talk about and talking about the life of Jesus and how he survived and all, is found in Luke 8, the first three verses. I'd like to read that right now. Sometime later, Jesus traveled through towns and villages preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. The twelve disciples went with him. We, you know, I don't know what you think of, but when someone says Jesus is traveling along with this group, what do you see? You see in your mind Jesus with twelve men, right? Yeah. But that's not all. And so did some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, what do we know about her? Sister. She, was, she was a prostitute. She was a prostitute. I mean, you know, here's Jesus, who's supposed to be a rabbi, traveling around with a prostitute. I mean, what does that say to you? Well, she had seven demons cast out of her. What does that say to you? I mean, if you were a preacher, would be, you would be happy to welcome someone who would, had been a prostitute and was demon-possessed? But that's not all. There was Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer in Herod's court. Here's a, a woman, a very you know, respectable woman, married to a very wealthy man. And she's traveling around with Jesus. And Susanna and many other women who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. How was Jesus supported? By women. By women. You're supposed to say amen. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I like Luke. <laughs> I think about every man back then was supported by a woman. <laughs> yeah. With all the work they did. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, a couple more things. Luke's gospel is about 30% longer than any of the other gospels. And if you look, if you have the original Greek, if you compare the gospel of Mark, that was almost certainly written first, 90% of the gospel of, Mark is co uh, gospel of Mark is copied either by Matthew or Luke or by both. Is that a case of, what would we call that? Plagiarism. Plagiarism? Plagiarism? Oh dear. Well, but it's interesting that Luke includes a number of very significant stories that we don't have in any of the other Gospels. The story of the Good Samaritan, the prodigal son, the rich man and Lazarus, the rich fool, the Pharisee and the tax collector, and a lengthy section about the ministry of Jesus in Samaria and Perea shortly before his crucifixion. Why is that in Luke and not in any of the other Gospels? Because the other Gospels didn't think it was important. What? Why was it not important? Because it was not a Jewish place. It was not, we're not talking about Jews. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, if you, if you, if you even mention Samaritans, if someone mentions a story about any kind of a Samaritan, you can bet the stories in Luke. It will not be in Matthew, it will not be in Mark, it will not be in John. Um, there's only a fleeting reference to, in John, in chapter 4, to the woman uh, of Samaria. They're just traveling through and they happen to run across her at the well. Other than that, there's no mention of Samaritans in any other gospel except, except Luke. Luke also, in Luke, uh, Jesus' ge genealogy. <laughs> genealogy. <laughs> genealogy uh, is different than Matthew's a bit. Yeah, why, why is that? Okay. Good question. We're going to come to that. Why is Matthew's genealogy different than, than Luke's? It was the father's side. The other one's from the mother's side, isn't it? Well, that's a good choice. Probably true. There, there are a bunch of different names. It's not the same people. That's part of the issue that you're talking about. But there's another reason. Maybe more important to Jews in Jesus' day. Matthew traces his genealogy back to Abraham. Through King David, Solomon, David, and of course all the way back to Abraham. And he stops with Abraham. And why did he stop with Abraham? Father of the race. He's talking to a bunch of Jews. Matthew was written for Jews. Mark was written to Romans. And they there's no genealogies, there's no long speeches in Mark. They the Romans, they just wanted action. They they were, you know, not into all this philosophizing or genealogy stuff. Forget that. So that wasn't appropriate. And, and John is completely different. John really focuses just on the things that Jesus did in Jerusalem. But Luke, he, he says he wants us to understand that Jesus came for the benefit not just of Jews, but of everybody. And when we say everybody, we really mean everybody. So how, where, does, where, does Matt, I mean, where does Luke trace his genealogy of Jesus back to? Adam, the son of God. Adam, the son of God, on Luke 3, back to, chapter, to verse 38. Well, um, let's come back and now look a little bit. What do we know about the first chapters of Luke? What does it talk about? He starts off talking about John the Baptist, doesn't he? What do we know about the story of John the Baptist? His parents had a not dissimilar happening alongside Mary and Joseph. Mary in particular, as yeah. far as being visited by the angel. Yeah. The difference There's being that uh, Elizabeth was an old, old woman. Yeah. And uh, John was an old, old man. You mean Zechariah? Zechariah. Zechariah, yeah. And um, so it was kind of a miraculous birth, kind of like Abraham, Abraham and Sarah. And Sarah. Yeah. But they and of had, course, sorry, go ahead. Well, Mary, her, the miraculous thing about her birth is she was a virgin. Yeah, yeah. But wasn't uh, John the Baptist, I think we would call him a prophet, and they hadn't had a prophet in a while. 400 years. Yeah. Yep, 400 years. And so we have this story of John the Baptist being born, and of course, it starts out with the angel Gabriel appearing to Zechariah. And what's Zechariah doing? Offered incense in the yeah. temple. He's ministering in the temple in Jerusalem, isn't he? Yeah, offered incense. So he's 
doing one of the roles of one of the most more important priests in in that in that very spot and they were chosen by lot and this was his time to be in the temple in Jerusalem offering uh, prayers and offering uh, uh, incense and what happened he had a stroke sounds like he it he needed a neurologist he needed a neurologist yeah but he had a suddenly a sudden miraculous cure of his disease and when was that and as the boy was named. As soon as John was named, he could talk again. So he lost his power of speech because he was doubting of this angel that appeared to him. Well, about six months into her pregnancy, Mary, I mean, I'm sorry, Elizabeth found out something else. What was it? Well, she was related to Mary, wasn't she? Yeah, she was a cousin to Mary. That's right, and, and I think, am I right? And I think Mary realized she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. So they were on Angel similar. Gabriel appeared to her and yes. also to her husband. They were on similar turf, you might say. Yeah. And Mary decided it was more comfortable to get out of Nazareth, mm -hmm. where everybody knew her when she, she was yeah. getting chubbier and chubbier. <laughs> and she went to visit her cousin. And you remember that they greeted each other with great joy and great delight because both of them were carrying miracle babies. Well, um, Luke is the only one that tells us about the after Jesus is born. Well, let, let's go back to the, the, the details of the birth. Um, there's a very interesting story about the birth of, of Jesus. Well, well, and again, let's, before I'm, I'm, I'm getting ahead of my story here. How do, we, how do we know how to date the birth of Jesus? We don't exactly, do we? Pretty precisely. Uh, Pretty close. Because of the census that Luke describes. Yeah. Not only that. The season. Uh, we're, yeah. we, just because we celebrate Christmas, this, uh, average people f kind of figure that's it. But actually, it was a different time of the Jewish year. It yeah. wasn't, wasn't the winter. OK. That helps to nail it down a bit. Well, let's try this. Look at Luke chapter 2, first three verses. At that time, the Emperor Augustus ordered a census to be taken throughout the Roman Empire. So we know it has to be during the reign of Augustus, right? Yeah. When this first census took place, Quirinius was the governor of Syria. So it has to be during the time Quirinius is governor of Syria. Everyone then went to register himself, each to his own town. And then if you go to chapter 3, um, yep, verse one. what does it say? 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Mm -hmm. It was the 15th year of the emperor Tiberius. Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea. Herod was ruler of Galilee. And his brother Philip was ruler of the territory of Iturea and Trachonitis. Asanius was the ruler of Abilene. And Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. I mean, there's a whole bunch of people that you can... Now, this is talking about later when they begin their preaching. But these are the, two, these are the ways we can nail down the, uh, the chronology of the life of Jesus. But you can't get the day. No, no, not the day. No. The last I thought you asked. No, no, no. <laughs> no not the specific day. Okay. Uh, we're lucky if we can get close to the year. Yeah, I know. You can get the year because that's yeah. what we're dated. But <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, actually, it wasn't in 0 A.D. Yeah, I know. It's not zero base, so it's, it starts with a one. The Roman numerals doesn't even know there is a thing called a zero. Right. Well... So we see here that Luke has made a, a concerted effort on several occasions to, even when it comes to the crucifixion of Jesus, to give us enough details so we can try to nail down the date, uh, you know, at least the year, of when these things happened. So that, that's a very helpful thing. Why is that useful in another respect? No, it, I mean, it's fine. It's nice for us to be able to say, yeah, this was the year. But why else would that be important? Prophecy. Prophecy, it gives us a chance to nail it down to compare it to the prophecies from Daniel. Yes, why else? Well, there are those that say he wasn't born, there's no record, and they have found records of Christ mentioned, Josephus, and in certain Roman, one or two Roman areas. Mm -hmm. uh, there are still extant quite good records on most of the Caesars and, mm -hmm. and, and of the various lineage and this kind of yep. stuff. I think, and I was just thinking as you're talking, there was 
there's one Roman procurator mentioned that for many, many years, hundreds of years, probably they could, they could find no record of, and I can't think who it was. And they found something in archaeology fairly recently that backs it up. Hmm. I'm not sure which one that is, but I can tell you that they, they, they found a stone up in Caesarea Maritima, right along the coast, that has the name of Pontius Pilate on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that wasn't too long ago. Yeah. I found that. Uh, so what, what, is, what is, in all of this, what's Luke trying to say to us? These are real people. Yes. Jesus is a real person. He lived in real times, real situation, real places. This is real, po folks. This is, not, this is not an allegory. This is not a make-believe story. This is real. Okay? That's, that's one of the main points that Luke is trying to make. Um, now, there's something else very interesting. Look at Luke, the very first chapter, the first three verses. Dear Theophilus, we've mentioned him already, many people have done their best to write a report of the things that have taken place among us. How many Gospels do we have altogether? Four. Be careful. We have four inspired Gospels that are in our Bible. How many do you have to have to have many? You're talking about the apocryphal New Testament? Well, I, I'm asking you, what, what, what's, what Luke... I, I'm not asking what I'm talking about. I'm asking what is Luke talking about? Definitely, well, John was definitely written later. Mm -hmm. So it's more than the two other Gospels. Okay, we, and Matthew know. was probably not written any before Luke, maybe even after. So how many, what, what Gospel... The only one he would have. Now, did Luke have any contact with Mark? Yes. What kind of, what do we know about that? They were on the... We know that in, in the later story, later time in Paul's, uh, gospel, Paul's life, both Mark and Luke traveled with him. So they would have had contact with each other, for sure. And of course, we understand that Mark wrote out whose who's gospel? Peter's. Peter's. Peter's gospel, his eyewitness accounts of what happened with Jesus. So we have those. Reading on here, they wrote what we have been told by those. So that means, I would suggest, there were other people, and I'm sure the devil was behind this, writing fanciful stories about the, and you read some of the apocryphal gospels even today, the ones, not, and we don't know how many have disappeared, not counting the ones that we still have available today, with crazy stories about Jesus playing in the mud and making little birds and clapping his hands and they fly away and all sorts of crazy nonsense. Doing things to the neighbor kids that the yeah. parents had to ask Mary and Joseph to keep Jesus away from their their kids. I mean, yeah. some crazy stuff. <laughs> Lots of crazy stuff. So I think I think Luke actually there were enough people already that I'm sure the devil was responsible for producing what what people thought maybe were true stories about Jesus. And Luke said, you know, I'm going to sit down here. And I'm going to write you an orderly account. Now, how could Luke write an orderly account? Uh, if he wasn't an eyewitness. And let me read verse 3 to just so you hear what it says. And so, Your Excellency, because I have carefully studied all these matters from their beginning, I thought it would be good to write an orderly account for you. I do this so that you will know the full truth about everything which you have been taught. Good research technique. <laughs> well, good you, researcher. you wouldn't have the bias to some people, maybe, um, if you're going at yeah. it to, and really interview people. Mm -hmm. he, 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 yeah, he, so he interviewed eyewitnesses just as a reporter or book writer would do today. Yeah. So are, are you saying that Luke grew up in Palestine? I didn't say that. <laughs> okay, no, what he, did you say? But he was... He, during, at some point in time after he had contact with the gospel, he interviewed people. Okay, there are stories not from the Bible, so we don't know how much weight to place on this. There's some stories that say that Luke was a Greek physician. There's no question about that, Greek speaking. His, and his Greek in, in Luke and the Acts and probably the book of Hebrews, he may not have written it, but he had some influence on the Greek there, is unbelievable. I mean, you read everything else in the Gospels before, I mean, in the New Testament before you come to to Luke, his is real polished and very sophisticated Greek. So, so he was a true Greek gentleman, a physician, a doctor, educated. Some people say he grew up in Antioch of, 
of Syria in those days. Other people say he grew up in Greece, but where did Paul run into him? You remember? In Troas. And we don't have time to read that now, but if you read Acts 16, Paul was traveling through and he got to Troas and he was trying to turn, he wanted to go north into Bithynia and that's where he got that message that says, come over to Macedonia and help us. And apparently he somehow ran into Luke at that point in time and decided that he would be a good person to have along and Luke became a Christian and left everything and followed Paul. And a few years later, quite a few years later, um, Paul on his third missionary journey ended up where? down in Jerusalem, and what happened to Paul? Arrested. He was arrested and put in prison. So apparently Luke was there with him for the next couple of years. So while Paul's in prison, what's Luke doing? Research. He's doing his research. He's going up and down and talking to a lot of people. And that's why in Luke there are m names of many people that aren't prominent characters. A lot of the bit players in the life of Jesus um, are, are mentioned in the book of Luke and including a lot of women. Why didn't you say that? <laughs> <laughs> including a lot of women. Like yeah. yeah. So Mark was in existence before Luke started writing. Yes. So as he did his research, he probably had Mark, the book of Mark. That to go and by and probably, general. He probably just plugged them in as, mm -hmm. he, as he put the story together. And that's why it looks, that's why you can parallel them so good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cutting and pasting. Yeah, cut and paste. Computer. That's right. Right, his word processor. Yeah. <laughs> and he had to, have be, being uh, like you indicate, his Greek is so good, he had to have been a well educated man for yeah. his day. And he, to get, w even, we tend to look back on some of those old physicians as knowing nothing. In some ways, in relation to today, that's true. But they knew more than we give them credit for. You know, there have An been analytical a analytical mind. Yeah. There have been some surgical instruments dug up yes. that look almost like modern surgical instruments. It's amazing the stuff. I mean, and think what kind of conditions they, if you wanted to do surgery, what kind of conditions you had to do surgery in? Well, I, With no anesthesia, etc. They uncovered sure, one right. of their Roman army hospitals and dug some of that up, and that's, you're yep. right. <coughs> now, we suggested a little bit earlier in our discussion that Luke was written to everybody. I'd like to read you a few words from Ellen White that would expand that story quite a bit. By coming to dwell with us, this is Desire of Ages, page 19. By coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. How can Jesus, by leaving heaven where the angels live, come to this earth living as a human being and reveal something about God to the angels. What other religious persuasion has that point of view? Nobody. It's, it's a vacuum out there com yeah. for comparison. He was the Word of God, God's thought made audible. But not alone for his earthborn children was this revelation given. Our little world is the lesson book of the universe. That where do you find that in the Bible? 1 Corinthians 4.9. 1 Corinthians 4.9. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look, 1 Peter 1.12. And it will be their study. Whose study? Angel. The angel's study throughout endless ages. Both the redeemed and the unfallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. It will be seen that in the meek and lowly one is manifested the character of him who dwelleth in the light which no man can approach unto. Well, how can love that was expressed by Jesus on the cross be, be demonstrated anywhere else in the universe? There's nowhere else that, that the situations could be yeah. so bleak and bad as down here. Yeah. And that's why I think that why they got so much more information by yeah. watching him. By yeah. seeing how God deals with rebellion, seeing how he deals with evil, so forth. They, they, didn't, they, never, they couldn't see that in heaven. Well, the, the first war in heaven, I suppose. They that's started. why this earth was created, yeah. to answer the questions that were raised in heaven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So that raises the next question. If Luke got his information from other people, that's kind of gossipy, isn't it? Not if it makes sense and it fits together like an investigator would. I see. Um, if you're Investigative if people, reporters? If people are just telling all kinds of these stories all over the place and they don't jive, you know, you know that's all mm -hmm. rumor. Yeah. Well, that's what you get in the other apocryphal gospels. Mm -hmm. It's cool. Well, so <laughs> but what we're saying is Luke was an investigative reporter. Mm -hmm. And he went back and he said, what do you know about it? 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 He went up and down the country, you know, um, and he found out a lot. He must have trusted Mark's writings mm -hmm. because it yeah. seemed like everything plugged into those writings. Well, it follows a sequence pretty mm -hmm. much. Of course, that's a sequence of Jesus' life. But, of course, remember that Matthew, Mark, and Luke follow basically, except for the final week, well, a week and a half of Jesus' life, they focus on the, la the one year when he was doing public ministry in Galilee. The, the, the year and a half before that and the, the about six to, eight, six to nine months between his Galilean ministry and, and his crucifixion, they don't talk about only, I mean these others don't, only Luke talks about those other periods. I, I, I take that back. Only John talks about those other periods. That's what I meant to say. Mm. Yeah. So there's some things that he didn't put in yeah. because he didn't think they were important or he thought they were already known. Well, and, and even that down. last statement I said wasn't completely accurate. John talks about the things that happened to Jesus in Jerusalem, and that includes those first year and a half. John is the one, he doesn't say very much, but he's the only one who says anything about that, first and a half, year and a half of, of Jesus' ministry. Luke and John talk about those last six to nine months because John talks about what Jesus did in Jerusalem, like the raising of Lazarus and and um, the the visit to uh, uh, to the uh, the Feast of Lights, and so forth. He, John talks about what happened in Jerusalem, whereas Luke talked about talks about what happened away from Jerusalem during those last few months. Was there any concern with the? the length of the Gospels, that the length that they would end up writing, because it's just like John or, or um, John said at the end, if we wrote down everything that Jesus did, the world wouldn't hold all the books. Yeah. So where did they cut it off? Or and maybe they thought that, you know, it needed to be so long and they couldn't put everything in. Yeah. Well, so, in, in, yeah. What are we reading here in uh, verse 4, uh, chapter 1? that you may know the truth concerning the things which you have been informed. Mm -hmm. So there was stories going out, yeah. he's, he's going to correct those. And then you, and this is fairly early on, then you get toward the end of the first century, the last book we get probably is the Gospel of John, and John, you go through the, all the stuff he's telling you, so that you'll believe, so that you believe. He's trying to correct a lot of more misinformation that's out there yeah. and, and clarify the stories. Isn't Luke the only one who mentioned that when after Jesus was resurrected, he uh, showed himself to the women first? I don't remember. Yeah. That's, uh, no, he's not the only one because Mark talks a little bit about that. John talks a little bit about that. So, no. But, but Luke does. Yeah. But th that, last, that last week or so, for more or less, all of the Gospels talk about right. that. That's the focus of all the Gospels. Each of the Gospel writers had a particular thrust that they were trying to get across, a particular mm -hmm. point, mm -hmm. and to a particular audience, and, uh, and that's it, why they wrote what they did. And it could have been dealing with the bogus information during that time. Mm -hmm. So it's like Jim said, you know, when, when John finally got there, then there was other bogus information. He deal, dealt mm -hmm. with that. Well, now, okay, so we've looked at, backed off a little bit and took it, took it into bigger picture. Let's come back down and talk about John the Baptist. What did he accomplish? Did, do we really need John the Baptist to prepare the way for Jesus, and how did he do that? Well, he sure caused a ruckus. Why? It seemed like everybody knew about him out there. Well, well, yeah, they did. And people would go out there just to... Just to 
satisfied their curiosity what in the world this guy's talking about. By the way, you will be interested to know that it was only about three or four years ago now that they discovered the actual place where John had been baptizing and so forth. And there was some ancient stuff and so forth there. And, and a year and a half ago, I went with a group there and we, they were still just starting to uncover uh, the actual place where John had worked on the other side of the Jordan. So you have to be in the country of Jordan to actually see the place where where uh, John the Baptist was working. Was it, was it a built-up place? or was wasn't it? at all, but it, I'm sure it's going to be <laughs> in uh, time. I mean, how would they find it if it was kind of a natural... Oh, it's, um, a, it's, a, it's a place where they've actually... They, there's a stone area, a place where people could go down into the water and so all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So they built, they had all that built for John the Baptist? <laughs> I don't understand. Well, pro probably not, but, but it probably was done by people soon, soon after John's day uh, to com you know, to, okay. to memorize the place, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what was it that got everybody so excited about John's ministry? This is Elijah come back to life. They had remember they had not. We mentioned this already. They hadn't had a prophet for four hundred years, mm -hmm. and what what was the last thing that Malachi had said to them? Well, Elijah. Hmm? Elijah will come. Elijah will come. What did you, someone have that, ver that verse right in front of them? I'll get it here in just a second if you don't beat me to it. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Verse? Verse uh, 4, verse 5. Yeah, Malachi 4, verse 5. Read on to verse 6. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. Yep. Very good, very now, good. Now, um, the fulfillment of that prophecy before John the Baptist came, mm -hmm. what would you actually think that that verse meant, that, that Elijah was going to return? Does that mean he was going to be resurrected from the dead? Most of them or probably thought that. Probably thought that. Did okay. Elijah die? No, Elijah went to heaven alive. Okay, so maybe he would come down from the... Yeah, um, back in, a chari in the chariot of fire. Maybe. Okay, so th there's something there that tells us about the fulfillment of prophecy, that, that the literality of it is not, isn't always what we think it is. Yeah, at the, well, at the but there's... Elijah is El, uh, Yahweh is God, is, is the way of saying, yeah. and, and Yahweh was the God of the Old Testament, and Yahweh came as Jesus. Yeah. So... Mm -hmm. Of course, they didn't Elijah. recognize him. Elijah is a certain type of prophet too. Yeah. Well, they know, have. And, their and I'm sure John was like that. But we're we're missing the real impact of John the Baptist. What was it that really? I mean, why did he get everybody's attention? Because he he was a herald of what was coming. He he seemed to have had some inkling of, of knowledge okay. of prophecy. He said. Apparently, under the influence of God, yeah. he said two or three things. One, the Messiah is coming. Right. One. What else? Repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized? We're Jews. Yeah. We're descendants of Abraham. We don't need to be baptized. We don't need to repent. We're automatically on our way to the kingdom, aren't we? Yeah, that's what they thought. That's what they thought. And the idea that, now the Jews did travel around the world and they sometimes baptized Gentiles to make them a part of the Jewish community, but the idea that Jews would need to be baptized, where did that come from? John the Baptist. So that was pretty absurd. And so they, that, I that mean, made people talk about him all oh over yeah, the place? Oh yeah, oh yeah. It shook people up, yeah. Well, another thing, it could mean that when the Messiah comes, you're, you're, we all need to be at a different level, you know? Right, and I, mean, so, I mean, what do you do? If you think, you think that you're automatically on the way to the kingdom and someone says, oh no, you've got to do this and this and this, whatever it is, you say, hold on, you know, what, what's going on here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and, and John the Baptist said, you know, if you, don't, if you don't do this, you're going to be separated from the kingdom of God. Now, what, about, what other, just very briefly, what other prophecies do we know about the Messiah coming from the Old Testament to start out with? What's the first prophecy in the Old Testament? 
Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15, which says, I will make you and the woman hate each other. Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head and you will bite her offspring's heel. Who is he talking to? Serpent. Satan. He's talking to the serpent representing Satan. So who is the offspring that's going to crush the head of Satan? Offspring of the woman, which is the offspring that we're talking about. <laughs> right, exactly. Deuteronomy 18.15, what does that say? Moses now writing, Instead, he will send you a prophet like me from among your own people, and you are to obey him. Okay, he will send you a prophet like me. Okay, that, I mean, think about the children of Israel. What, when they thought about Moses, what did they think about Moses? What, what came up in their mind? Well, he was very close to God. And they, yeah. yeah, because he did what? We gave him the Ten Commandments. Yeah, but more than that, what happened before the Ten Commandments? Freed them. He freed them from Egyptian slavery. Now, what are, now, what, now what's happening to them in the day of Jesus? Days of Jesus. They're under Roman oppression. So what's the Messiah going to do for them? Free them from the Romans, right? They had it all figured out. No question in their mind. What else do we know that was predicted? Bethlehem. Okay, Micah 5, 2. Very interesting verse. The Lord says, Bethlehem and Ephrathah, you are one of the smallest towns in Judah, but out of you I will bring a ruler for Israel whose family line goes back to ancient times. Now, that's a, a very practical sort of reading. Uh, look at one of the more traditional readings. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you one will go forth from me to be ruler of Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. What does that mean? The eternal one. You've all heard this story, but I, I have to tell it because I just love this story. There's a story told of an older black pastor in the southern part of the U.S. was telling the story about Jesus, who at the age of 12 was in the temple. And his parents had left him behind, and so there he is, and he's being questioned. He's 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 being questioned by the scribes and Pharisees, and he's question questioning them back and forth, and they can't believe how smart he is and where he learned all this stuff. And finally, one of them. This is the story according to how the old pastor tells it. He says, "Son." Talking to one of the scribes and Pharisees speaking to Jesus, how old are you? And Jesus says, well, on, mother's, on my mother's side, I'm 12. But on my father's side, I'm older than time. <laughs> I, just, I just love that. That's a, a great story. Yeah. So that's really what we're talking about here, isn't it? Yeah. And then there's a couple of references in, in Acts, 20, Acts 3. Uh, for Moses said, The Lord your God will send you a prophet just as he sent me, and he will be one of your own people. You are to obey everything that he tells you to do. Anyone who does not obey that prophet shall be separated from God's people and destroyed. And all the prophets who had a message, including Samuel and those who came after him, also announced what has happened, been happening these days. So what is, what is Peter saying here about the prophecies about Jesus? He says, You better get on board. This is, the, this is the Messiah we've been looking for, and now you've crucified him. You better pay attention to what, what this guy had to say, right? Well, of course, then there's the story of Isaiah 7.14 that a lot of people think about. Uh, and you have to read Isaiah 7.14 in, in different versions to get the full picture. Let me read first from the New American Standard Bible. Therefore, the Lord himself will, will give you a sign. Behold... And this version says, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and, he shall be, and shall, she will call his name Emmanuel. And if we go over to chapter 9, the same child ends up, ends up being called what? Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, right? Mm -hmm. Who's that? God. Jesus. Jesus, obviously. He's talking about Jesus. So this is a prophecy about the birth of Jesus. But was the baby that she was talking about back in Isaiah 7, 14. Was that Jesus? He said, before he's old enough to say, Mother and Daddy, these two kings will be chased away from sieging Jerusalem. That's not talking about Jesus. 
Mm. It's talking about a child that she had with, with Isaiah, Isaiah's son. So if you read the, my modern translation, it will say, well, then your Lord himself will give you a sign. A young woman who is pregnant will have a son. We'll name him Emmanuel. And in the context of, 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 of Isaiah 7, the young woman was Isaiah's wife. And his, one of his names of his child was Emmanuel. So, so the point, um, what are you saying in conclusion here? Well, Isaiah is giving us a, she start, and this happens a lot of times in the Bible. We don't have time to go into the deep parts of this prophecy, but many times the prophets would say, okay, look at this situation that's happening right here. Isaiah's wife is going to give birth to a baby and it's going to portend certain things that are going to happen right now. But then it has a later application, a much larger application, because this baby is going to be a sign of a baby who's going to be born 700 years from now, who's going to be what we already said. You know, mm -hmm. wonderful counselor, everlasting father, prince of peace, you know, mighty God. So it, the child, the first child was was Isaiah's son, but the child that he was predicting was Jesus. It was a parallel yeah. concept. Yeah, yeah. So they call that type and antitype? Type and antitype. Yep. Well, there's no question about the fact that the virgin birth of Jesus was a totally and completely unique event. Never happened before, has never happened since in the history of our world. There's no way to explain it humanistically or naturalistically. Is that why so many people who want to poo-poo Christianity just arbitrarily just say it didn't happen? Couldn't, you know, this, this can't be true. They, there's no way for them to rationally, somehow or other, try to explain a virgin birth. So? With a male. What? With a male. Yeah. Theoretically. Well, that makes it even harder. Yeah, well, theoretically, you could do it with a, with, with a female egg. And, Parthenogenesis, yeah. yeah. But uh, not with a get that Y chromosome in there. Mm -hmm. Of course, it makes perfect sense if you've got a God. Well, sure, but they don't, they don't want to admit that there's a God. Yeah. There gets knowing. They call mm -hmm. that agnostic. Yeah. Do you think Mary had any idea when, you know, the, Gabriel said the Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you? Did you think Mary had any idea when she got to be pregnant? I don't think she understood. She really knew, knew. Because that, that's quite a, oh, I can't really imagine it. It's, it's when God hard. comes that close to you, do you think you'd feel it? I, you know, I, I read that. I don't know what it means, actually. Mm -hmm. It overshadows you. Well, um, yeah, there's some visions I can come up with, but I still don't know exactly what he meant by that. Yeah. Well, look at this story. This is, this is the famous story, Luke 2. We're going to talk about the first seven verses. At that time, the emperor of Augustus ordered a census to be taken throughout the Roman Empire. When this first census took place, Quirinius was the governor of Syria. Everyone then went to register himself, each to his own town. And where did Joseph go? Joseph went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to the town of Bethlehem in Judea, the birthplace of King David. Joseph went there because... He was a descendant of David. He went to register Mary, who was also a descendant of David, who was promised in marriage to him. She was pregnant, and while they were in Bethlehem, the time came for her to have her baby. She gave birth to her first son, wrapped him in strips of cloth, and laid him in a manger. There was no room for them to stay in the inn. What's a manger? Something cattle or sheep feed out of. Yeah. Imagine that. The king of the universe is born and wrapped in strips of cloth, no fancy garment, no king's robe, and laid down in a feeding trough for animals. And he's born in a, he's born in a, not a pig pen, but just about. Verse 7. Yeah. He said, firstborn son. Mm-hmm. That is implied she had nope. more after that. She gave birth to her first son. Yeah. My version says. Okay. It was her first son. Okay, I understand that. Does that uh, leave it open that she might have had some more? Yeah, oh, well, it yeah, does, but there, there, uh, there are other, if that were the only verse you had. And then you got Matthew uh, yeah. 125, 
Joseph did not know Jesus yeah. until uh, Mary until after the birth of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, those things. But there are other reasons why we, you know, the fact that Jesus said to Mary and to John at the cross, John, take care of mother, mother, here's your son. If she had other children, he would, they would automatically have been expected to take care of Mary. So it's quite certain that she did not. Well, have maybe yet. John was a half brother. Well, John was not a half brother. John could have been a cousin, possibly, because he was he was the, he was the son of of um, Zebedee. Zebedee. Yeah. Is the reason that um, Joseph went to Bethlehem is that because his family had land there and that's where they had to go to? Well, that's that pay taxes on this particular property. That's the way they had of tracing family lines to see whether or not everybody who's supposed to pay taxes is paying taxes. Because the Jews were really big on genealogies. Okay? How, do you, how, how does the government know whether you're paying your taxes? It's called a social security number. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You've got to have some way of tracing people. Okay, well, reading on. He went to register with Mary and so forth and so forth. She gave birth to her first son, wrapped him in strips of cloth, laid him in a manger. There was no room for them to stay in the end. There's something very interesting that happened in connection with that. Try to imagine Mary, who was in her nine month of ninth month of pregnancy, traveling by donkey all the way from Nazareth to Bethlehem so that they could pay the Roman taxes. Once again, Luke was doing his best to place the birth of Jesus in its historical context. But when they arrived in Bethlehem, there was no room for them in the inn. There probably was only one inn in the whole place. Mary's perfect baby, the Son of God, was laid in a feeding trough in a small enclosure designed for animals. What does this say to us about God? And I'm reminded again of Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. Let me just look at that really quickly. The attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had. He always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had. From being the king of heaven, he comes down to be a cold baby wrapped in strips of cloth, lying in a feeding trough for animals. He took the nature of a servant, uh, Paul says in Philippians. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. Well, he died as a traitor to the Roman government. The first visitors to see and proclaim the arrival of the new king were a group of shepherds. What was the status of shepherds in, those, in Jesus' day? Rock bottom. They were at the bottom of the social. Why was that? Well, first of all, they had to be out in the field almost day and night. It wasn't, it wasn't a comfortable life. They had to deal with animals all the time, including animals that died. They had to shear the sheep and so forth. They were at the bottom of the totem pole. So why would God appear to them? They were the only ones that were sort of searching. They had realized that the time must be getting close. Here's this incredible story, and it's, it's a little bit long, but I, I have to read it. Uh, it's a small part of it's in Desire of Ages, but this is from the book Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, 198 and 199, and I'm going to read it. An angel visited the earth to see who are preparing to welcome Jesus, but he can discern no tokens of expectancy. He hears no voice of praise and triumph that the period of Messiah's coming is at hand. The angel hovers for a time over the chosen city. What would be the chosen city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem and the temp temple where the divine presence was manifested for ages. But even here is the same indifference. There is no evidence that Christ is expected and no preparations for the Prince of Life. In amazement, the celestial messenger is about to return to heaven with the shameful tidings when he discovers a group of shepherds who are watching their flocks by night and as they gaze into the starry heavens are contemplating the prophecy of a Messiah to come to earth and longing for the advent of the world's Redeemer. Who's expecting Jesus? Or who's looking forward to it? Shepherds. Shepherds. A group of shepherds out there in the fields of Bethlehem. 
here is a company that can be trusted with the heavenly message. Can Herod be trusted? Absolutely not. Can the scribes and Pharisees be trusted? Absolutely not. They have other things in mind. What about the people in Jerusalem? Where are they? Ignorant. Indifferent. Mm -hmm. And suddenly the angel of the Lord appeared declaring the good tidings of great joy. Celestial glory flooded all the plain. Can you imagine it? An innumerable company of angels were revealed. How many angels do you think wanted to come down to earth and be a part of the group to announce the coming of the Messiah? Probably every one of them, right? Now, I don't know where they all came, but I'm sure that these shepherds couldn't believe it. All of a sudden, that entire sky is lighted up with angels. Um, and as if the joy were too great for one messenger to bring from heaven, a multitude of voices broke forth in the anthem which all the nations of the saved shall one day sing, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Do you think the shepherds had ever heard music like that before? Nope. nope. Oh, what a lesson is this wonderful story of Bethlehem. How it rebukes our unbelief, our pride and self-sufficiency. How it warns us to beware lest by our criminal indifference we also fail to discern the signs of the times and therefore know not the day of our visitation. It is therefore now... I'm sorry, it is unto them that look for him that Christ is to appear the second time without mm -hmm. sin unto salvation. When's the second appearing going to happen? Yeah, to whom it's going, going to happen? Those who are looking for his coming. Will the angels find us preparing for the second coming? Well, what have we seen? Let's do a little summarizing. We've got a few minutes left, not much. Let me just read you something about Luke himself. Luke, the writer of the gospel that bears his name, was a medical missionary. In the scriptures, he is called the beloved physician, Colossians 4.14. The apostle Paul heard of his skill as a physician and sought him out as one to whom the Lord had entrusted a special work. He secured his cooperation and for some time Luke accompanied him in his travels from place to place after a time, Paul left Luke at Philippi in Macedonia. Here he continued to labor for several years, both as a physician and as a teacher of the gospel. In his work as a physician, he ministered to the sick and then prayed for the healing power of God to rest upon the afflicted ones. Thus the way was open for the gospel message. Luke's success as a physician gained for him many opportunities for preaching Christ among the heathen. It is the divine plan that we shall work as the disciples worked. Physical healing is bound up with the gospel commission. And the work of the gospel, teaching and healing, are never to be separated. Ministry of Healing, page 140, 141. Does that mean that doctors and pastors maybe ought to be working together? Hmm. I wonder if that could apply to us in our day. Well, let, let's be honest now. Do you have any questions, any doubts about the virgin birth story? I believe God is capable of anything. Once you that's, have that, you cannot, you know. That's what Gabriel said to Mary, wasn't it? Do you think, is, is anything impossible for God? No. Okay. Any, any of the rest of you, what do you think about that? Why do so many question that? that story probably because it doesn't happen very often well of course that's that's a fair enough comment yes mm -hmm. what else they don't like the implications of yeah. what what follows if see you, if you uh, if you believe that this is divine event that God actually was born as a child then you have to take serious what Jesus said and did and you have to take serious what was what happened later and the prophecies about his coming and the prophecies that lead on beyond his coming. And you have to take serious the fact that he's coming back. Is that really important to our understanding of the gospel? That you believe it? Mm -hmm. I think you should believe it. I don't know if there's any... <laughs> well, the, 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 I mean, let's be honest. The story of Jesus is one miracle after another, isn't it? 
Well, try to imagine. I'm trying to get you to think in the biggest possible setting here. We're running out of time anyway. What do you think Satan and his angels had to say when Jesus appeared as a baby boy? Now we'll get him. I am sure they had all kinds of plans up their sleeve. We got it. And of course, we know about this, the, the story with Herod tried to destroy all the baby boys. I'm sure, if you read about how things were going on in those days, I'm sure Satan said, I'm within that close of, of having the entire world on my side. And then God mows and messes things up by sending his son down here. What do you think you would have heard if you had been in one of Satan's councils about that time? We can do this. We've got him. Yeah. A baby boy? Surely we can figure out some way to get rid of this kid. Well, he knew he was coming. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a surprise. Yeah. Well, as ordinary human beings, we struggle with the idea that Jesus could have been fully human and fully divine at the same time. Thomas Aquinas struggled with that idea as well. He said, in order that the body of Christ might be shown to be a real body, he was born of a woman. But in order that his Godhead might be made clear, it was, he was born of a virgin. Think he was right? Ellen White said this comment, like the stars in the vast circuit of their appointed path, God's purposes know no haste and no delay. When the great clock of time pointed to that hour, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And what clock do we know about? That was Desire of Ages, page 32. What yes. clock? He had already been predicted. The exact time of his birth, the, the, the time of his, well, the time of his ministry, actually, was predicted, and we can, we can, time, we can go back from that. Well, we hope you've enjoyed our discussion of the early events in, in the life of Jesus and John, uh, his forerunner. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about Satan and his attitudes and his behavior, Jesus and his behavior and what he did. This discussion of the book of Luke is going to be absolutely fascinating. I hope you'll be with us all the way. It is an inspiring story, and Luke did a marvelous job of putting it down for us. Enjoy. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for this privilege we have of drawing close to you and studying this marvelous story once again. Be with us as we open the book of Luke as our prayer in Jesus' name.